Today we're in Philippians chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 19 through 30 as we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study here in the book of Philippians. And what I'll do is I'll begin at verse 19, and I'll read to verse 24, and then we'll move into verse 25, and then we'll conclude at verse 30. We're looking really at qualities of one who serves the Lord, and we have two examples that we'll be looking at, a, a young man by the name of Timothy and a second individual by the name of Epaphroditus. And so beginning at verse 19, reading to verse 24, Philippians chapter 2. Paul writes, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I, may, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which, which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once, as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. And so Paul here is speaking in verses 19 through 24 of a, of a visit, a visit that a young man by the name of Timothy will soon make to the church. I want you to notice how he begins here. Notice how he says, I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy. In other words, though he is planning on sending Timothy, he gives us some insight. He doesn't want to presume on the Lord, and that's why he says, I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy. You see, Paul knew something that many people need to learn. I need to learn this. I need to continually learn this. Though he might have plans, the Lord may have different plans. And he didn't want to give the impression that he was directing his own path. That's why he's saying, I trust in the Lord Jesus to send him to you. I'm not, in other words, directing my own path. I'm waiting on the Lord. I'm trusting the Lord that he's part of this, that he wants me to do this. In Proverbs 16, verse 9, it says, A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And so Paul knew that his plans had to be submitted to the Lord. And that's a good thing for all of us as believers. Though we may have plans that we make, we need to submit those plans to the Lord because God may have something for us that is better than, he always, it's always better than our own plans, but he may have something for us that we just don't see. And so rather than making choices and doing things on our own, we submit those plans. We say, Lord, I'd like to do this, or I'd like to go here, or I'd like to whatever, and I just want you to open those doors if it's of you, and if it's not, please, Lord, I ask in Jesus' name, would you please make it so clear that you're closing the door that I don't presume, presume on you and do something that you're not in. I'm asking you to do that for me. I'm asking you to direct my footsteps. You know, he wanted to do something for the Lord. He wanted to send Timothy so that Timothy might do some ministry, but at the same time, he submitted to the Lord. You see a similar kind of thing in the book of Acts in chapter 16. In Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 10, it says, When they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Chino. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's my version. <laughs> they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Paul had a desire to go where the gospel had yet to be preached, and he desired to go into these various regions, but every time the Holy Spirit put a door there so that he couldn't enter in. And then finally the Spirit says, no, what I really want you to do is to go into this, this region. And that's how we need to do it. And that's why Paul says, I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly. I'm submitting my plans to him so that I know that I'm in the center of his will. If you take notes, James says something in chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. He says, listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. If it's the Lord's will. So we don't presume on the Lord. We submit to the Lord 
and we give him our plans and we say, Lord, I think you're in this. I desire to do this. Lord, I want to buy this house. It looks like the door is open. I can make the payments. It looks like it's something we can do. And, uh, but I'm submitting this to you. I've had people approach me saying, I have a great opportunity to buy a house. It's in another city or another state. And uh, I was just wondering what you think about that. And I, and I always say basically the same thing. The very first thing I normally ask is this, where are you going to go to church? And they'll say things ordinarily. I've heard this many times. Oh, there are a lot of great churches there. And I'll say, really? And which ones have you sought out? Which ones are you familiar with? What church will you go to? Well, you know, we'll find that out when we get there. And I, I always have a difficult time with that because that demonstrates to me that you're not seeking the Lord. You want a house. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting a house. But I want a house that is built by somebody that's going to make that house last. And it's got to be something more than just a house that I live in. I want something that's everlasting. And therefore, I ask the one who's the architect of those things that are everlasting to lead me to the right place to dwell. I want to make sure that when I move or where I go, there's a place that I can learn of the Lord and serve God. So it's not an afterthought for me. It's the first thing that I'm concerned about. Where am I going to go and grow in the Lord? Where am I going to go to receive of Christ? Because though the house might be a great deal right now, I don't know that that's the place I'm supposed to be. Submit your plans to the Lord and ask the Lord to direct your footsteps. He'll make it very clear. So Paul says, I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly in order that I might be encouraged when I know your state. So Timothy is going to come, but... Timothy, as Paul's representative, is going to have a tremendous responsibility. And so he's saying, I'm going to send him there because he's going to receive a report and bring it back to me. And so as his representative, he has tremendous responsibility. And so in the verses that follow, we're going to get some insight into the kind of man Timothy was. And I see in these things here, not only in the life of Timothy, but also in the life of Epaphroditus, the qualities of somebody who is serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think what we can learn from these things, some very practical things. Now, as we look at this, I want you to notice something. This portion of the letter of Philippians is really in many ways what has been referred to as a letter of recommendation. It's a letter of commendation. It's a, a letter of introduction, if you will, or reintroduction. And many times letters of commendation or introduction were written in the early church. You see that in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 3. When I arrive, I'll give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. There were times that there would be letters of commendation, letters written so that when somebody would show up, that person who's showing up is actually going to be trusted by those who are receiving him. Because during that day, there were people who were going from house to house, from church to church, and sometimes they were bringing uh, doctrine that really wasn't acceptable. And so Timothy is really going to be going there as a representative of Paul. And so Paul is making sure that they're aware of that. This man, Timothy, who is really my protege, really somebody I'm mentoring, somebody that I trust, is going to be coming to you. And I want you to know that I'm sending Timothy in order that he might be able to bring to me a report. And so he's saying that. And he's saying, I'm sending him so that I might be encouraged when I hear how you are doing. Now, we need to remember that Paul cared deeply for them, but he couldn't personally come. You see, Paul was incarcerated at that time. So he sends one who shares his concern. He sends one who would be referred to as my genuine or my true son in the faith. And we're going to be looking at him and seeing some things about him that can help us as we grow in our knowledge of Jesus Christ too. Now, when he says, I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. He goes on to say, for I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. I have no one like-minded. The first thing I want to point out is that this is one who sincerely cares. You see, Paul loved the Philippians. And as somebody who loved the Philippians, he wants somebody there ministering to them who shares that kind of love. He wants somebody that loves the way that he loves. He wants somebody who shares the same concerns Paul has on their behalf. He wants somebody who has a spiritual maturity and a great desire to be of service to those whom he ministers to. Now, I want to get practical with you as I look at this because there are things that you can see in here that can help you and will also give you some insight into ministry. 
I, I would say to you that today it's rare to have somebody serving alongside of you in ministry who actually loves the sheep. It's rare. Sadly, for some, a position in ministry can be a stepping stone to something that they think is even greater or better. Many years ago, over 20 years ago, I approached my pastor Chuck and some people in, in leadership, and I said, you know, I'd like to have an assistant pastor's conference, a conference where the assistant pastors of Calvary Chapel gathered together. This is a long time ago and can be instructed in the ministry of assisting. And so I went about seeing if we could put something together and discovered that there was really at that time little or no interest in doing something like that. There wasn't really a response of those who were assistant pastors at that time. And so I was wondering, I wonder why that is not, you know, something of interest to people. And I was speaking to another pastor and he says, you want to know why? The assistant pastors are not responding to an assistant pastor's conference. And I said, I'd like to hear why. He says, it's because they don't want to be assistant pastors. They want to be senior pastors. And the idea of them coming to an assistant pastor's conference isn't as, as, as um, you know, isn't something that they'd like to do as much as have themselves coming to a senior pastor's conference. And I, I think that in some ways at that time, that may have been very true. There are a lot of people who look at ministry as being a stepping stone to something else. So they begin by doing something small, not because they enjoy doing that which is small, not because they enjoy doing it and not being noticed, knowing that their commendation comes from God, but because they're hoping that in doing that small thing, somebody will notice and give them something else and then give them something else and give them something else until ultimately they get the keys to somebody's office and, and they're a full-time minister. So it's not really as if they've got a heart to serve, it's really a stepping stone to something greater. And there are numbers of people who are like that, who don't understand that the greatest in the kingdom is the servant of all. Who don't understand that it's a better thing just to enjoy the things that God gives to you and to do them faithfully and allow the Lord to do what he wants in your life. Sometimes we strategize our own lives and we want to do something more that we think is greater. And we don't have an understanding that to be a servant is what God has called us to be. Our church was maybe two years old at the time, two and a half years old. We used to meet in a small industrial building in the city of uh, Ontario on Grove Street. We had, we had offices there and we had Wednesday night and we had Sunday night services there. And after an evening service, I'll never forget this, we only had 120 chairs that were placed out there and when we had people in Bible study, because they were not locked down, when people would get up and scoot out, you know, the chairs would be moved all over the, all over the little hall there and so, you know, we would have to straighten them all out again for the next time we were going to meet there. And so there was a young man who approached me after the service and was speaking to me. And he was telling me, I want to serve the Lord here. I want to be used by God. And, and I said, is that right? Well, talk to me about it. And I'll never forget, I was in the back of the hall. And I started going through every row, one at a time, straightening all the chairs out to making sure that they were, you know, in order and straightened out. He followed me through the entire hall as I straightened out every one of the chairs, he never picked up one of those chairs. He never helped one time because he was so busy wanting to be a servant that he wanted to tell me what it means for him to want to be a servant. And I think that a lot of times people get caught up thinking, you know, to be a servant of the Lord is to, to be well respected or to have authority or to be able to have an office or to receive some kind of salary or to have your name in a bulletin or, or whatever it may be. Some people think that a position in ministry is a stepping stone to something else. There are those who uh, get into the music ministry and, and it's really for them not ministry at all. For them it's a stepping stone to a recording contract. It's not that they have a desire to go out and sing in the name of Jesus Christ for whatever it may be. Odin's been involved in music ministry for as long as I've known Odin. Odin is a great musician, a great vocalist, has been for as long as I've known him. And he's done a lot of worship ministry and a lot of service. And he used to travel with friends and they go off and do ministry. And uh, it was because they wanted to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, not so that they'd receive a paycheck, because often they didn't receive a paycheck. They're not receiving one tonight either, but they, they, they often didn't receive a paycheck. Got to thank you very much in a hot dog. 
and they would drive sometimes. Odin's told me all the way up to San Francisco in that area there in their little Volkswagen van or whatever, and they wouldn't even get gas money to come back because people were trying to capitalize on the Jesus movement and the Jesus music, and they were getting these Jesus freaks so they could bring kids into the church and, and have them listen to Mustard Seed Faith or whatever, and, and they were doing that kind of thing. But there were people at that time like Odin and so many others who were there just serving Jesus and not for the paycheck. But that's not always true, and it's not that true today as it used to be. There are many people who, who audition, who want to do music in churches because they see it as an entryway into becoming a recording artist. So there needs to be a sincerity. There needs to be a sincerity in serving the Lord and a sincerity in loving the people. And Paul wanted someone who sincerely cared for the people. It's a blessing. It's a blessing when a minister can recommend somebody who truly loves others. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 16 and 17, said, I thank God who put into the heart of Titus the same concern I have for you. For Titus not only welcomed our appeal, but he is coming to you with much enthusiasm and on his own initiative. I thank God because God put into the heart of Titus the same concern I have for you. For me in this ministry, when somebody is serving alongside of me and others, my great heart and great desire is that they will love you, that they will love the sheep, not just a position, not just an office, not just a title, but they will love the sheep. And that's what Timothy was like. Timothy sincerely cared for their state. Now, a second thing, and this is something you might not even notice. In verse 19, when he says, I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy, a second thing about him uh, is an insight that I get because this is one who is going to be sent by Paul, which tells me there's a relationship between Timothy and Paul where Timothy is under orders. He's one who is submitted to the apostle Paul. Again, if you're going to be used by the Lord, you need to have a heart that is submitted to biblical authority. There are quite a number of people who do not have a heart that's submitted to authority. They say, well, God speaks to me just like he speaks to you, and this is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to do it, and if you don't like it, that's too bad. You're quenching the spirit in my life. Well, Timothy wasn't like that. I've discovered something a long time ago. If somebody is faithful in that which is least, they'll be faithful in that which is much. If you ask somebody to do some very small thing and they, and they do the thing you ask them to do, I can trust them to do something else that might require a little more faithfulness and, and a little more maturity. But if they'll do the small thing, then I can trust them to do a greater thing. If they don't modify the request, if they don't just change it around and say, well, you asked for this, but I brought you that instead because this is really better than what you asked for. I may have a reason that I asked for this specific thing because there's a particular reason for it that I don't have to tell that person for. I simply want them to get what I asked them. But if they go out and modify and change things, they're showing me something about their character. They're not faithful in that which is least. And I get careful with people like that. I really believe that authority and being submitted to authority is something very important. There's a story found in the book of Matthew chapter 8. It's a story that relates to the city of Capernaum and a certain centurion who had a servant who was ill. And the centurion has come to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's speaking to him concerning this servant who is very ill. And, and he wants Jesus Christ to, to, to heal his servant. And, and Jesus says to the centurion, I'll come to him. And, and the centurion says, no, you don't have to do that. I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. But he speaks to the Lord Jesus Christ in this way. He says, I am a man. I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. I, too, am a man under authority. What are you saying, centurion? I'm saying that I know the chain of command. I know how authority works. And I, as a Roman centurion, a man who is responsible, who is over a uh, 100 soldiers, I understand authority. If I say to somebody, go, he'll go. If I say, come, he'll come. I'm a military man, and I understand authority in the military. And I've looked at you, Jesus, and I know that you, too, are under authority. And so I know I can trust you, and all you need to do is speak a word, and my servant will be healed, because you have authority. Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, is what he says. Speak but a word, and he will be healed. 
And Jesus, looking at him, understands that this man knows something of authority and how the kingdom of God operates. And he says, I haven't even seen faith this great in Israel. This is a Gentile who understands proper authority. I haven't even seen a Jewish individual who has that kind of understanding. And so Timothy is going to be sent because Timothy is somebody who's trusted. And Timothy doesn't see himself as being equal to Paul. He sees himself as being a servant to the Lord as he ministers alongside of Paul and fulfills the request that Paul might have for him. He says again in verse 21, he says, I'll seek their own and not the things which are of Christ Jesus. Now, when it says, I'll seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus, we can ask ourselves a basic question. Well, who are you referring to when you say, all seek their own? Well, all we need to do is remember the first portion of the book of Philippians, and we need to remember that there are those that are building their own kingdoms that Paul has been speaking about. Remember in chapter, uh, chapter 1, in verses 15 through 17, how, how Paul had said, Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from good will. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. Those all who seek their own are the ones who are building their own kingdoms. So in contrast to those who are building their own kingdom, Timothy has a different heart than those people because he's not seeking his own interests. Now, another element of the quality of Timothy and a minister is the motives are pure. You see, some enjoy the attention they receive for doing the things that they do. But Timothy sought the things of Jesus Christ, knowing that the reward would come from him. Some people love attention. They desire it. They crave it. Even spiritual things they want to be seen for and known for. They want to be known. They seek the limelight. They seek the attention of others. They desire it, even demand it. When I was in high school, I believe I was a junior, and we had to go into the pool. And so all of us in gym class, all of us were in the pool, and we shared the pool, obviously, with the freshmen and the sophomores and, and the seniors. And, and I can still remember as I was in the pool there, and there was a freshman who had come in who was standing on the high dive. And as this young kid, this 14-year-old boy, was standing on the high dive, he started yelling to the coach. And he started yelling, Coach, look at me. I'm going to jump. Coach, look at me. I'm going to jump. And he was jumping up and down in the high dive, screaming across the pool to the coach who was on the other side. Coach, look at me. I'm going to jump. Now, I was a junior at that time. I started hoping he'd fall, let alone jump. You know, jump and shut up. Get in the water. Be quiet. And you're making a fool of yourself. Look at me, look at me. I've never forgotten that. There are people who are like that 14-year-old, even though they're adults and in ministry. Look at me, look at me, I'm going to jump. Look at me, you need to see me. Pay attention to me. When you greatly desire the attention of man, that's a very dangerous place to be. When you do ministry to be seen by men, you receive reward from that man, from those men. They seek other things. But Timothy was one who sincerely sought the things of the Lord. He didn't want the attention. He wasn't seeking that. He wanted to do the things for the Lord. So from the Lord, he'd receive his reward. It's what we read in Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you'll receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. And so the motives of service are pure. You don't do it for attention. It's been said the most beautiful thing that you ever hear is your name on somebody else's lips. People like that attention, but you have to die to that. You have to die to that. Now in verse 22, he gives us a fourth thing. In verse 22, he says, You know his proven character that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel, as a son with the father. First, he's got what you call a proven character. Character is formed through pressure 
and is revealed over time. Character is tested through time and experience because under trial, character is revealed. There was an old saying as I was growing up that related to sports. They would say, sports builds character. Sports doesn't build character. Sports reveals character. It doesn't build it, it reveals it. What are you willing to do in order to get your goal is revealed in sports. That's why so many of these athletes, you know, have you know, asterisks behind their name now. They might have hit those home runs, but they did it when they were juiced. They didn't do it honestly. They didn't do it with integrity. They didn't do it right. Because the sport did not create or fashion character, it simply revealed what was inside of them all along. And that's what happens. Under pressure, your character is revealed. What you do when you're under pressure shows what you really are. It's been said, if you, if you kick a vat of vinegar, vinegar is going to spill out. If you kick a vat of apple cider, apple cider spills out. Whatever's in the vat under pressure is going to be exposed. And so character is demonstrated over time through the pressures and trials of life. And this is a young man who had a proven character. And his character was proven by the manner in which he served. Timothy had remained faithful to God and in his service to Paul, even under pressure. Now, as you study the life of this young man named Timothy, you see that he had disadvantages that would have worked against him. You read concerning the fact that he was naturally shy. You see that he was relatively young, that he was often in poor health, and he was under constant opposition. These are things you see in First and Second Timothy when Paul is writing and encouraging him because he's young. Therefore, he's saying, you're not, God hasn't given to us a spirit of fear. You're a timid man. He hasn't given us a spirit of fear. He's given us a spirit of, of power, of love, and a sound mind, Timothy. You need to understand. And then you say, let no man despise your youth or drink a little wine for your, your frequent infirmities. He was under constant opposition. We know that because he was a young man in, in a culture that, that valued the older. And so what he had were a lot of disadvantages. And in those pressures, he, he demonstrated what he really was. In your pressures, you demonstrate what you really are. That's what happens. And so he says he has a proven, proven character. He's remained faithful to the Lord, and he's remained faithful to me. For Timothy to even see Paul in prison took courage. Because by coming to see him, Timothy would be under the scrutiny of Rome. They would know that this was a man identified with Paul who was in prison for preaching this message of the gospel. And so for Timothy to come and see him would have required tremendous courage on his part. When Paul was writing in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, he said to Timothy, Do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Timothy, instead of being ashamed, served Paul like a son would serve his own father. A son has a loyalty to a father that is unmatched when there's a true and genuine love relationship between the two. I think it is absolutely, absolutely tragic when you see a father and a son who don't love one another or a father who has a problem with the son and it's public. There's a show on, uh, on, on television, a lot of you have seen it. I used to watch it a few years ago when it first came out, I, I really don't watch it anymore. But it's about a son and a father who work in Orange County Choppers. And some of you have seen it, Paul Jr. and his father. And it is sad. It's really sad to see how his father, Paul Sr., treats his son, Paul Jr. Just the attitude he has towards him and his desire to see him fail. And there's just so much. And I, I've, I've seen some recent episodes, I think two of them. And um, the part of the reason that I've done so is because um, Paul Jr. Uh, has reportedly uh, recommitted his heart to Christ and I wanted to see how he was how it's going for him and you're gonna see it on that show and I remember him in the earlier days when he had a language problem and all kinds of other things that he was going through 
And I wondered, is, is his light shining? And so I put it on to watch to see how Paul Jr. was and to see how his father is com competing against him and to see how his father is speaking of him and what his father has done and, and that the pain, it, it just breaks your heart. It's sad to see a father who doesn't love the son. But when you have a son that loves the father and the father loves the son, you have a loyalty that is unmatched, unmatched. Because the son will serve alongside of the father in a genuine way without a desire to take from that father anything that belongs to the father, but rather as a son who is honoring the father, they'll do whatever they can to make sure that that father is cared for. I have two sons who are like that with me. Two sons, my son David and my son Joseph, are extremely loyal to me, their father. And I thank God for those sons. I thank God that they love me the way that they do. And, and I trust them with everything. I trust them with my life. I trust them with my heart. And a, a son's loyalty to the father is unmatched. You see, Timothy has come to faith in Jesus Christ through Paul. And Timothy has traveled extensively with this man. And Timothy saw firsthand the life that Paul lived. And, and he heard the consistency of the message that he gave. And that's why Paul could commend him. In 1 Corinthians, in chapter 4, verse 17, uh, Paul said, For this reason I am sending to you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. So he's not ashamed of me, but he serves like a, a son serves a father. So I will send him, he says in verse 23, as soon as I see how it goes with me. Now, moving into Epaphroditus. He says in verse 25, I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one, and the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick, for indeed he was sick almost unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I sent him the more eagerly, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem, because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service to me. And so verse 25 through 30 speaks of Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus is only mentioned in this particular letter. Epaphroditus is the one sent by the Philippians who brought financial aid to the apostle Paul. And as you look at verse 25, it reveals that he had remained behind to minister with and to the apostle. But according to verse 26, he had gotten ill and he had to return to Philippi. So Paul is writing to commend his service so that he's not viewed as a coward or an apostate. And so as he's writing concerning him, notice how he speaks of him. First, he speaks of him in verse 25 as my brother. In other words, he's my brother in the Lord. Timothy is a son because he came to faith through Paul, but Epaphroditus is a brother who has gotten right with God through some other minister. So he's my brother. Second, he's my fellow laborer. In other words, we work together in the field of, that belongs to God. We work together in the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's my fellow laborer. The third thing he is, is my fellow soldier. We are involved in spiritual warfare. And so this is an individual who has been alongside of me. It's a picture of a, a wounded comrade in arms who's been sent home from the front lines to rest and to recover. One of the things we need to understand, and this is something that I think the church needs to return to because sometimes we forget it, is that we're in spiritual warfare. And it's been said that the church is the only organization that has a tendency of shooting its own wounded. And that's probably true to some degree. And uh, Epaphroditus could have been looked down on because he's returned to the Philippians. Uh, he's returned to them. And, and Paul, uh, they might have thought that he abandoned Paul. So Paul has to write a letter saying, no, he's returned because he's my brother. He's my fellow soldier. He's been faithful. He simply got ill. So don't look down on him. He didn't abandon me at all. But here we are in spiritual warfare, and he's a fellow soldier. He's somebody who's a comrade in arms. He's somebody that cares about the things of the Lord. And, and in the midst of all of the things that we've gone through together, he's somebody that I've grown to love and respect very highly. I appreciate him. 
I appreciate the fact that he hasn't abandoned me. I appreciate the fact that he remained behind to care for me. I appreciate the fact that he represented you. He brought the gift that I needed for my needs and all. He brought that, and I'm thankful to God. And therefore, I commend him because he's a fellow soldier in the spiritual war that we are waging. I, I have discovered that not everybody understands spiritual warfare. Not everybody realizes they're even in it. But when you have somebody who understands spiritual warfare, there's this relationship that develops between you two that is, is, is really a very solid and very powerful bond that you have with that individual. You share things together. You share your life and you share the love of Christ in a way that is so unique to spiritual warfare. It's so unique to Christians. And you develop relationships that are based on things that are extremely spiritual. There's just nothing like it when you minister alongside of somebody and together you see the Lord bring somebody into the kingdom of God. There's nothing like it when you have people during our church services who are praying so that the word of God goes forth and touches lives. There's, there's nothing like it to know that you have people right now praying for you, praying that God will move. Even right now there are people praying right now in the back room for this church service that God will move in our lives. There's nothing like that. And Paul had a relationship with this man that he wanted them to know about. He said, this is one who's a spiritual soldier alongside of me. But verse 25 says, but he's your messenger. And he's the one who ministered to my need. You have cared for my physical needs. You took care of my necessities. And he's the one who brought them. Now, in verse 26 and 27, it says, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. Indeed, he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. He desired to return home because he missed you, but he also had to go home because he was ill, and he didn't like the idea that you were overly concerned for him. He had gotten ill while serving the Lord. Some people think that ministry is easy and fun and painless. Ministry is fulfilling, and sometimes it is a lot of fun. But it's never been painless, I promise you that. And it's never been really easy. Because Ministry relates to pulling people out of the clutches of Satan. And when you actually go out and do that, you become a target. A target that the enemy will go after, and sometimes he does so with a force and a violence that you can't even imagine. There are so many illustrations of this. But one comes to mind that we all understand. In the life of Pastor Greg Laurie, Greg is a reserved man. I've known Pastor Greg for a long time, for many years. And I can tell you that Greg is a great guy, loves the Lord. His wife, Kathy, is an absolute doll. They're jewels in the kingdom of God. They're tremendous people. And I have nothing but the highest respect for Greg Laurie. I admire him like I admire few people because I see him as a man who is consistent in his quest to bring glory to Jesus Christ. And he is somebody that, that I respect and have respected since he was a young man. He began really ministering when he was around 17 years old. And he's been in the ministry for probably 40 years. And he's a young man now. He's around 57, 58 years old. He's been in the ministry for over 40 years, serves the Lord faithfully, and I have watched God use him in many, many, for many years. When he began the, the summer harvest ministry and, and when so many hundreds into the thousands of people began to show up, and you've seen thousands of people over the years who have received Christ, answered invitations he's given, you begin to wonder, when is the enemy going to take notice and do something? When is the enemy going to do something? Because Greg has become somebody that is doing great damage to the evil kingdom. So when his son had that tragic accident and lost his life, 
In the life of Greg, I can say this, I think, honestly and openly. There are very few people that he really loves with all of his heart. And Christopher was one of them, probably his closest friend. And to lose his son was a blow that very few people could have handled, to be honest with you. It was something beyond. And, and the, the letters that were coming to the editor about Christopher, the things that were being said about him, and the things that were said about Greg Laurie, when all that went down, they were published in the Orange County Register, and I read several of them. And they said, oh, the kid was speeding, and basically we're saying he got what he deserved, you know, that accident's happened. And the crushing pain that that man went through when he lost his son was, was very, very terrible. And all who knew him and all who loved Greg had broken hearts, broken hearts, for the pain that that man went through. And yet, what was he doing? Almost immediately, because the accident occurred just before the summer harvest, what did he do? He went up and preached the gospel. He went out and shared the gospel. And he gave messages from a broken heart and still to this day does. It's one of those things that you're not going to heal over. You're going to continue carrying a wound the rest of your life. And you know it. It makes heaven a lot more beautiful, a great place to go. Because your treasure's there. Christopher's his treasure. And so to return, to one day go and see him, it's going to be a, a glad reunion. It isn't painless, guys. Ministry is not easy. It comes at a cost. It comes at a, at a pain that, that many people will never understand. It comes with accusations. It comes with trials. It comes with hurt. It comes with disappointment. It comes with a cost that you couldn't understand. When my friend Randy Walls, who's the pastor of Calvary Chapel Upland, approached me almost 20 years ago now and said to me, I want to go out and plant a church. I feel that God has called me to be a senior pastor and I desire to be set free to do that. Randy could tell you this, it's a true story. He was on staff with me and he was in my office and he approached me and he said that, I wanna go out and I wanna pastor, I wanna be a senior pastor. And I can tell you the truth, you won't probably understand this when I say this, but I looked at him and I said, you don't know what you're asking for. And I cried, I cried. Not because my dearest and best friend wanted to leave. No, of course not. He's, we still see each other more than we should. We're very dear friends, always will be. But I looked at him and I said, Randy, you don't know what you're asking for. Jesus one time was approached by his men and they said, actually the mother, their mama said, uh, grant my request that one might sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your kingdom. You remember Jesus' response to that request? You know not what you are asking for. Are you able to drink of the cup that I am going to drink? Oh, yes, Lord, we are able. No, you're not. You don't understand what you're asking for. You don't know. I've been in the ministry for 37 years. That's a long time, I'd say. 37 years. And I know what it's like to have your face on somebody's dartboard where they really don't like you and they say things about you that are unfair and untrue and extremely painful. And they do it because they love you. They'll even tell you that. I love you, so I'm telling you the truth. Say, I love you, I want to pop you in the head. <laughs> I had a guy approach me one time who said, my ministry is keeping speakers humble, and I want you to know how bad your message was. And I said, Raul, that is so painful. <laughs> Why do you have to say things like that to me? It hurts me terribly. No, that's true. That's true. That's just ministry. I've shared in pastor's classes, if you want to be in the ministry, develop a thick skin. Because sheep may not be that bad, but they certainly do bite. And they are, they are more than willing to, to chew on you as much as is possible and blame you for everything that they've done. They do. And so you have to have a thick skin in ministry and you have to have a heart that is right with the Lord. 
and it isn't as easy as it appears. Yeah, it's a blast. I love it. I could do nothing else. But it came with a cost. It came with a cost. When a lot of people are putting their heads on the pillow at night going to sleep, people like me and other pastors like me are praying for them and praying for the church and praying for their problems, praying for their kids, praying for their families, praying for their lives. We pray like that. We do that. That's my life. I've been doing that for 37 years. Where people will walk up to you and they'll say, my wife just left me. My son just died. My dad went home to be with the Lord. I've been in the front of the of the church and I've had someone walk up and say can you pray for me my mom died two days ago then the person next to me says will you pray for me we're getting married and then somebody after comes after and says oh you know bless the Lord I just want you to want you to know that 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 we're pregnant then somebody else comes and says I want you to know that my wife just ran off with my best friend one after another and and you, you at one moment your, your your eyes are tearing up because somebody is so hurt and then the next person comes up who's so happy and you feel like a schizophrenic, and I don't mean that in a bad way, and I'm, not, and I'm certainly not trying to be insensitive. What I mean is it's, 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 it swings from one point to another in, 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 one sec in like one second. One person is saying, I just am rejoicing in the Lord, and the other one is saying, I'm brokenhearted, and it's in the same conversation in a 25-minute period in between services. And that happens most every time I go out to speak after the church services. The people who walk up to you are not walking up saying, I just want to talk to you about you know, football and stuff. They're talking to you about things that matter. They're talking to you about their lives and the things that they're going through and the pain that they're experiencing. And I'm losing my house or I lost my job or I don't know what I'm going to do. That's ministry. And so it isn't easy. And when somebody says, oh, I want to be a minister, it isn't something that you go into lightly. This is someone who got ill serving the Lord. Ministry can be hazardous. It, it even can be life-threatening. And, and many who have served the Lord in ministry have paid the ultimate price. And in the case of Epaphroditus, he had gotten ill while serving the Lord. It was a severe illness. And what you see that it almost resulted in his death. And his pain was compounded when he knew that his friends at home were concerned for him. Paul says in verse 27, indeed, he was sick almost unto death. God had mercy on him, not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I sent him the more eagerly that, that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness. Hold such men in esteem. Because of the work of Christ, he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. He almost died, but God was merciful and he recovered. And that blessed Epaphroditus. It gave him opportunity to serve the Lord, to serve Paul as he did so. Now, I should say this quickly. It doesn't make you less spiritual if you get ill. Sickness is the result of the fall and it strikes both the believer and unbeliever alike. You see, there's a doctrine that was very popular, and I believe it's still held by many, that basically states if you're a Christian, you should never be sick because only those who are in sin or have no faith have illnesses. And, and uh, we called it the uh, positive confession movement, and, and all you need to do is declare you know, promises from the scripture. But the bottom line is, is that even believers can get ill. And in 2 Kings 13, verse 14, it speaks of a prophet by the name of Elijah. And it says Elijah was suffering from the illness from which he died. When, when Paul was writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5, verse 23, he said, stop drinking only water. Use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20, it says, I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Epaphroditus was somebody who served the Lord with all of his heart, but he had gotten ill while doing so. But God had mercy on him, and he recovered. And he finally says, receive him with gladness and hold him in esteem. Because God is using him, and he served the Lord totally. He lived a life that was full on for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the kind of man you ought to respect. Not the individual who has all the outer trappings, but the man who is 
or the woman who is yielded completely over to serving the Lord in whatever capacity they have the ability to do so. Whether it's somebody who is, is a great mama who's caring for the kids and raising children who are going to serve Jesus, or whether it's a man who travels as an evangelist, it really doesn't matter. If they're serving the Lord faithfully and doing all that they can, you hold them in high esteem because these are individuals who are doing the work of ministry and serving Christ. It is a fallacy and it, it is a problem when we begin to establish um, criteria that makes certain people more important than others. The pastor of the church is not more important than the member of the church who's sitting in the pew. I am no more important, I know that and so do you, than anybody else in this church. We are all sinners saved by the grace of God, just doing what God has called us to do to the best of our ability. I've been called by God to do what I do, and I want to do it faithfully. You have been called by God to do what God called you to do, and you do it faithfully. And God gives us the reward. That's the key. May we serve him faithfully.